John Russell Rickford is a former president of the Linguistic Society of America. He was elected to membership in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Sciences. Rickford is co-editor of African American English, now available as a Routledge Linguistics classic. In this interview, he discusses his latest book, Speaking My Soul. I am John Russell Rickford, the author of Speaking My Soul, which we're going to talk about today. And this is my wife and co-author, Angela Rickford. My name is Angela Marshall Rickford, and I am a professor of education at San Jose State University uh, Emerita here in California, where my um, work and teaching have focused on literacy development in underrepresented populations. And I should mention that she is, we've, she, we've been married for 50 years, and she is the co-author of this other Voteledge book, um, African-American Creole and Other Vernacular Englishes in Education. Um, so we've done a lot of work together um, over That's those 50 idea. years. <laughs> Why did you write Speaking My Soul? Yes, well, if you see the prologue of my book, um, I had a stroke in 2019, 10 days after I retired from Stanford, um, after teaching here for nearly 40 years. And this made me aware of my mortality. Um, if I'd been living in Guyana at the time, there's no doubt that I probably would have died, just as my father and my two brothers before me did. They died in their fifties, one minute, just early sixties. So I was really saved by the medical care at Stanford, and I wanted to write a memoir about my life for my family and then maybe for a, a wider audience. So Speaking My Soul does just that. It begins with my very earliest memory, which is riding on my father's shoulders when I was less than four years old, as he went downtown in Georgetown, then British Guiana, to see the lights in the government house um, lit up to celebrate Queen Elizabeth's ascension to the throne in June 1953. Then they described the bedroom where, as the youngest of nine, I used to share with my brothers and sisters, with bunk beds on this wall to accommodate all of us. Then I talk about my journey to America when I was 18, to go to university, working with African American English, and meeting world famous black leaders like Rosa Parks and Dennis Brutus and August Wilson and um, uh, Sterling Brown, he actually was a student of mine, and Richard Jontel, the very close friend of Shavon Martin, who was talking to him by cell phone until seconds before he was murdered. You have done a lot of research into your DNA and family tree. How did the results of this research affect your understanding of your own identity? Well, in chapter two, called Four Bears, I talk about some of this research that I did. Um, so the DNA that I did, um, 23andMe and Ancestry.com, revealed that I was about 33% to 34% African, 70% East Indian, 3% Amerindian, and about 48% to 50% European, which is comparable to Henry Louis Gates, um, the Harvard professor of Finding Your Roots um, fame, who is also 50% European, and who notes that the average African-American is about 29% European. Mm -hmm. So DNA hasn't really answered all my questions. For instance, after spending a good sum of money, we have neither a name nor any other information about my great-grandmother, who was a mixed-race woman from Barbados. We know just a little bit more about her husband, um, Henry Wilson, who was a Scotsman who came from to, to British Guiana about 1860 to be chief engineer at Enmore Estate. But we do know that a black Guyanese father and daughter, Norbert Wilson, and his daughter Zoe, are, are related to me through DNA. They have the pictures in the, in the book. Um, and they're from Golden Grove Village, 
which is just next door to Enmore Estate, where um, Henry Wilson worked. And um, he had constructed a cane grinding uh, steam mill there in 1882. So we're still exploring the exact nature of that relationship. But definitely we share DNA on my mother's side, which is the right side for that question. So on my father's side, the crucial question wasn't about my great-grandfather, who was Walter Howard Rickford. He was an English sugar magnate who ran a plantation in the quarantine area. What was the name of the... I forgot, I forgot again the name of the estate. Enmore? No, no, no. My grandfather. Anyhow, Wilson in quarantine. Hmm. But the question was about the identity of the East Indian indented woman named Poverty, with whom he had two children, including my father's father, Donald Howell. Uh, Walter Howell never married pa Poverty, and Donald and his sibling, uh, Jeffrey, were raised in the home of Poverty, where she lived with her indentured husband. They also had a daughter between them, Alice Ann Marie, who married a dispenser, Robert Carey, and they had some incredibly successful children, including Dr. Frederick Carey, who I used to go to for medical treatment. But I didn't realize at the time that we were related. <laughs> you know, I know I would always go to him after hours um, for shots or other medication. So in 2020, I interviewed my cousins Diane Carey Alamin and Sherry, Sheila Carey Bender in Toronto, which is on page 15. And Diane's daughter helped us to get a photo of Alice Ann Mariah, which is included in the memoir. So all these Carey relatives are more clearly East Indian. And this is also true of my Aunt Bunny, or Jean, we call her Bunny, who is 28% East Indian. But quite surprisingly, my um, Aunt Bunny was also 70% African, which must have been true of my father, who was her brother. So I inherited African genes from my father and my mother. As I say, woohoo. <laughs> <laughs>